Okay, well, uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this talk, Asian Etymology, Achieving Faster Progress and More Secure Results. So we start uh, from the assumption that uh, etymological dictionaries are nice to have and, uh, and having more of them would be a good thing. Uh, and then we observe uh, that there's an inequality in the distribution of etymological dictionaries. So a Brazilian who's curious about the origin of a Portuguese word uh, can turn to uh, one of several etymological dictionaries of Portuguese, uh, but a speaker of any of Brazil's 217 native languages struck by a similar curiosity has nowhere to turn. Less than 1% of the world's 7,000 languages have etymological dictionaries, and at a time when 40% of the world's languages are endangered, addressing this inequality uh, is urgent and would uh, yield uh, very broad benefits. So why aren't there more etymological dictionaries of more languages? Well, etymological dictionaries are slow and expensive to compile. They are not uh, commercially viable. Uh, and just uh, to talk through some examples, the Französisches Etymologisches Wörterbuch uh, required 80 years uh, between 1922 and 2002 to uh, be published. Looking a little closer to our own field, the Sino-Tibetan Etymological Dictionary and Thesaurus uh, was planned to have 80 fascicles. Of those, only one was published, uh, despite an investment of 28 years and over $3 million. Uh, and like this example, many etymological dictionaries are never finished. In contrast, bilingual and uh, monolingual lexicography has, has really um, entered the digital age. Uh, in particular, the availability of large corpora has revolutionized the ability to, com to compile such dictionaries. We'll just look at uh, one project that's kind of at the vanguard of this development, uh, eLexis. So they have three uh, interlocking products uh, that help uh, speed up uh, dictionary compilation. Uh, Sketch Engine, which organizes uh, raw or, or, or annotated corpora of language use to best showcase uh, the distinctive behavior of different words. They have something called one-click dictionary, which then organizes this data into an automatically drafted dictionary. Uh, and then they have a third product, Lexonomy, which provides an environment for editing uh, that automatically compiled dictionary for, for publication and, and also a publication environment. So what about uh, etymological dictionaries? Well, basically, the working methods of etymological lexicography remain uh, unaffected by the digital revolution. Lexicographers type out data from printed books which they arrange and manage in general database uh, and word processing software with no use of specialized tools. So how does progress happen at all in etymology? It happens uh, via uh, having a, a large investment of, of labor and uh, a, a thriving collective um, environment of researchers who, who gather and scrutinize hypotheses. And this crowdsourcing, if you like, has served European languages relatively well with as many as 20 uh, Italian dialects having etymological dictionaries. Uh, but without the generous support of national funding bodies, dictionaries of less well-resourced languages are not compiled. So, uh, so we think that for new etymological dictionaries of understudied languages to be compiled at all, and for the dictionaries of well-studied languages to continue improving, etymological research demands automation. So uh, we see there's being basically two tasks to automate in the first instance. One is the, the identification of related words, and the other one is uh, the identification of changes in pronunciation. So just to take uh, an example, first uh, is something like the fact that English foot uh, and German Fuss descend from uh, uh, fought in Proto-Germanic. This fact is dis divisible into, into two facets. One is the mere association of uh, foot and, and fuss as, as probably somehow related. And the other one is, is the proposal that German changed a T into an S in this environment. So automated uh, methods exist for both tasks. These are automatic cognate detection and uh, mechanized historical phonology. 
And our workflow uh, um, aims to combine these two. So we are looking at the Burmish family where there's, there isn't a lot of previous scholarship uh, on historical phonology. Uh, this gives you a sense of where the Burmish languages are spoken and something like the, the family tree of the languages. And uh, in terms of what materials we rely on, we almost exclusively rely on this, uh, this uh, book from 1992, uh, edited by Huang Bufang, wh where uh, a, a certain list of, word, of, of ideas, rather about 2,000 concepts, are given in 40 uh, Central Tibetan languages. But we augment that uh, in the case of Burmese with, with the relevant literature, with old Burmese. And then this is just to give you a sense, one page from Kwan Bufan's book. Uh, here it's the meaning uh, one uh, listed in uh, a bunch of Sino-Tibetan languages. When given a set of words in different languages, the algorithm tells you which words in this set are likely to be related. We're going to see an example later. And so there are older methods which are based on actual phonetic similarity and are less robust. And newer methods that are already a little bit historical linguistics themselves. And they do calculate the recurrent phonetic correspondences. And so basically uh, here uh, we use in our methodology the Lexstat algorithm uh, developed by Johann Matthias List. And uh, so here is an example of the kind of thing produced by the algorithm. So we feed into this algorithm a lot of data in different Germanic languages. And uh, these, these data are indexed by semantic identity. So here is a here is a row of different Germanic words for women. And the algorithm gives a similarity score. So for example, uh, Danish kvinna is very similar to Swedish kvinna, but German Frau has nothing to do with English women. So it's like uh, hun almost 100% dissimilar. So if we plot this score on a map and, and there are algorithms that can cluster the results. So the algorithm knows that, notice that, okay, this Frau and this Frau look similar enough. So they are one class, this is another class, and this is the third class. So looking to mechanized uh, historical phonology, it relies on the fact that sound change is regular. I'm going to talk through uh, uh, one example uh, very swiftly, which is uh, the Indo-European word for eight, something like hokto, which gives us eight in English, octo in Latin, ashtau in Sanskrit, uh, all via regular uh, sound change. So let, let's just look at how this works in the case of English. We have to get first to Proto-Germanic and then to Old English. Looking at the consonants first, the, uh, the H disappears before vowels. The palatal K merges with a plain K and then uh, becomes uh, H according to Grimm's law. Turning to the vowels, O changes to A in Germanic. Uh, long O remains longer, uh, but then merges with long A. And uh, with these changes in this order, we are, have arrived at uh, the Proto-Germanic form. Now moving from Proto-Germanic to Old English, uh, A changes to A, and then front vowels including A break into diphthongs before certain consonants. So for our purposes, changing Acht into Eacht, uh, unstressed diphthongs are monop monophthongized, <laughs> so changing to into to, uh, and then unstressed o becomes a. And that's how we get uh, from 
to to uh, and the details of this don't need to, to concern you. It's just a, a, a basic methodological point that that sound change is regular. Each of these changes happened at a specific moment in time across all of the words uh, in the language that they could apply to. And one of the major goals of historical linguistics is to figure out uh, historical phonology, uh, the relative chronology of different sound changes and to, to reconstruct ancestral forms. So uh, we can teach a computer ordered changes like this and then uh, run the changes backwards on the tested forms to find possible reconstructions. And we can run them forward on reconstructions to check that everything is working according to plan. Uh, or, you know, to refine our understanding of historical phonology as the case may be. And uh, it's an important principle to never adjust the protoforms uh, you know, in an ad hoc way, but instead have the protoforms generated by uh, the attested forms. So here, uh, using a, an online uh, platform for finite state transducers uh, developed by Tiago, uh, sorry, Tiago Trisolde uh, in Jena, I have, uh, I have formalized uh, the, the changes from Indo-European uh, to Germanic affecting the word for eight. And you see down at the bottom, it says apply down, hokto. So that's where I say, okay, apply these rules to this Proto-Indo-European form and I get the uh, Germanic form on the right. And then if I apply the same changes backwards by just saying apply up uh, to the Germanic form, I get this whole list of options. And this is characteristic in terms of uh, information is, is lost over time. So a attested form can lead to multiple um, ancestral forms through this backward reconstruction. Now, of course, many of these aren't possible words in Indo-European, but that's extraneous information that has not yet been modeled. And uh, uh, we see as actually one of the, the points of, of using methodology like this is to force yourself to increasingly have to explicitly model more and more information. Uh, so that so that uh, knowledge that is tacit becomes knowledge that's explicit. So we are going to look at one of the hypotheses of phonological history. Okay, so here is a toy version of Burmish. Uh, so it's not old Burmese, but proto burmish So from proto burmish ba, it gives ngo chang po. And uh, how do we actually encode, encode something like this in, uh, 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 in transducers? Well, so this needs to be, um, basically it needs to be div in, divided into two parts. There is this definition of the phonotactics of the proto-language, which is shared by all daughter languages because every daughter language projects back to the same proto-language, otherwise they won't be related. So, uh, a proto burmish syllable, in our toy example, is made of an initial, a rhyme, and a tone. And it's quite readable. Notice that we just um, put definitions together to say that they are linearly concatenated. And uh, an initial is one of the following. B, B, glottalized B, M, or glottalized M. And similarly, so the rhymes where uh, we have just two choices, R and E, and tones. Okay, so we see that ba is a legitimate proto burmish syllable according to our toy definition. Now, how does it change into bo? Well, there is the first sound change, burmish devoicing, which happens that b is devoiced into b. So this is the foam, this is the syntax of the, of the FOMA language, which um, fortunately stays quite similar to the SPE kind of notation most linguists are familiar with. And the actual daughter language can be defined as a, as a kind of application relationship. So you take the proto-language syllable, you apply on 
it the first sound change and then the second sound change and it gives the actual predicted form in Mucha. So uh, the use of finite state transducers for this sort of backward reconstruction uh, has some history in, in linguistics. Uh, in particular, uh, Hewson wrote this uh, computer-generated dictionary of Proto-Algonquin. Uh, however, uh, what, 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 uh, his, his method is uh, something that relies on having figured out a lot of historical phonology beforehand, which is also the case in the example of, of, of eight that I gave earlier. I knew what I needed to formalize. And uh, more recently, uh, Pisolo has been using finite state transducers in the modeling of, of historical phonology of Indo-European and similarly was relying on a huge body of scholarship of, of previous knowledge. And also, his efforts uh, are not uh, terribly successful simply because the Indo-European languages in question are quite uh, distantly related. Uh, so analogical change um, also needs to be modeled. And that's not something we're, we're going to get into. Basically, uh, the, 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 it's just a remark that this, the use of finite state transducers in historical linguistics works better with lower level subgroups. then there is a complete methodology that can lead to etymological dictionaries, which is the, which is the methodology of back projecting dictionaries. The mechanized historical phonology can back project whole dictionaries, but only in conditions of near perfect knowledge. When you just approach this language group, uh, of which you don't have like a very profound knowledge and nobody has because it hasn't been studied that pretty deeply, um, you, it's very difficult to create the initial hypotheses from raw lexical data. You need something to work from. The basic problem is what I call the exploratory deficit. That is to say that there is no way to go from a state of very little knowledge to towards a state of, um, of much knowledge. And if we decompose this exploratory thing, we, we get two basic components which we try to solve in, uh, in our project. Uh, the first one is bootstrapping. That is to say, uh, we need to create the initial hypotheses from raw lexical data. So we have something to improve on and we have a computerized uh, assessment mechanism for gradual improvement. So the human linguists are truly supported in their gradual improvement of the hypotheses. So the way that you can make it practical as a methodology is by having a way to get it started, which is bootstrapping, and a way to make gradual improvements. In our methodology, the algorithm and the transducers are combined in the following way. The algorithms are used to produce a preliminary version of cognitive assignment. Then human linguists gradually correct the preliminary cognitive assignment using transducer enabled user interface. So this uh, gives us the what I call the CAPER workflow. So it's computer-assisted proto-language reconstruction because basically you, uh, in the ideal sense, which we have uh, quite approached in our Burmish case, we start from a huge blob of, of words from a certain language group and we work with that and we actually end up with a reconstruction of, reco of the proto-language. So the, the actual data the human linguists in the workflow is working on is the bipartite hypothesis. It's called bipartite because it's made of two parts. So there is this hypothesis of phonological history, how the sounds of every individual language changed from the proto-language of the group to the individual daughter languages. The other part of the bipartite hypothesis is the, um, the lexical cognitive judgments. So it's quite simple. So uh, since we're do dealing with um, 
Southeastern Asia monosyllabic kind of languages here. So basically every polysyllabic word uh, is divided into syllables. Then every syllable belongs to one of the cognates. And uh, so for example, the first syllable of the word for brain, ow, it belongs to this set to which also belongs the word, the first syllable, wu, in the hair word in the Longchuan Achang language. Given the cognitive assignment and given the hypothesis of, uh, of historical phonology, it is uh, quite simple to predict the protoform of a certain cognate set. So for example, we have this, uh, these forms, maru pik, bola pi, and achang pi, which all means uh, a tear. And we, and we can see here, so for example, Maru has uh, had underwent, had undergone some kind of uh, sound change, which made the, which made B in all the three possible tones um, confounded. So if you see Maru Bik, it could be Proto-Burmish B, B in the H tone or B in the X tone. And similarly, so in Bola, B, can be reconstructed back to B and B. And finally, in Longchuan Achang, B can be reconstructed to all those different proto burmish forms. And it's quite easy to, in this case, it's quite easy to predict that uh, given all these forms, the most probable form is B. So that's what actually happens in the uh, in the dictionary review. So this is the preview of the compiled dictionary. So uh, the uh, there are some um, languages that have B only. So it ends up that the uh, the computer considers B the most the most probable reconstruction in boldface, but B, B, H, and B, J, I are also uh, possibly not entirely to be ruled out. And different, uh, and here we can see that different forms, uh, different actual attested forms can be uh, projected back to different um, protoforms. However, in the dictionary, in the dictionary view, all the protoforms displayed are the protoforms not uh, judged as probable by the by the system. So let's talk about the organization of the entire caper workflow. The we begin by the stage of uh, pre-processing, so the source word lists uh, need to be pre-processed by the by the linguists, and then the at the bootstrapping stage, uh, the algorithm pr produce one part, so the cognate set part of the hypothesis, and human linguists try to uh, work with that to produce the first version of the hypothesis of. Uh, phonological history. From this first crude bipartite set of hypotheses, uh, we got a lot of different um, user interface which help the human linguists to gradually refine the bipartite set of hypotheses to account for the linguistic data. And this is an iterative process. So when you make one part better then the other part automatically gets better too. At least you get more, ter more materials to work with. And once the linguists judge that the, uh, the material is good enough, fit for print, then the um, stage of finalization happens where the prepared hypothesis can be um, made for publication in the form of an etymological dictionary. 
so here is how the iterative improvement works. So as we see here is the, uh, we have the hypothesis, we have the bipartite hypothesis, which consists of the cognitive judgments and the phonological history. So with the first version of the bipartite hypothesis, the human linguist use the cognitive judgment reassignment interface to, to improve the cognitive judgment. So we got human correct cognitive judgments here. And so those cognitive judgments are uh, quite good. So they can be fed into the correspondence pattern view algorithm to produce correspondence pattern view, which uh, used in the phonological history debugging interface can allow the human linguist to make the phonological history better. So better cognitive judgment results in better correspondence patterns and better correspondence patterns give the human linguist a better view of the phonological history. So the human linguist can uh, encode the better understanding of, hum of phonological history into uh, transducers. Then the transducers are used in refishing. And with refishing, um, the computer produces uh, uh, in some cases better and in some cases worse, but always easy to change kind of uh, cognitive judgment and which can be uh, corrected by the human linguist again. Well, and, and, and maybe the point is that um, refishing always includes more data than the last iteration. And that the better your transducers, the better your back projections from the dictionary, right? That basically we're gradually transitioning from mostly relying on the algorithmic approach to mostly relying on the uh, transducer approach. Conceptually, we have, I'll say three different parts, the transducers uh, and the stored cognate judgments. That's just two parts. Yeah, let's yeah, say we have- and, and, the th and the third part is the actual source word forms and glosses, which are like, which are stored uh, uh, in the application. Yeah, okay. So, um, so, so it looks like you've sort of integrated everything together. So maybe just um, talk me through here, like what should we do for first? Should we should we po paste in a transducer or exactly because uh, because in general these transducers are debugged in the other app, so they kind of get changed quickly, and so uh, every time that we start to you uh, every time that we uh, modify the uh, the co sorry the cognitive judgments. Uh, we put the uh, we put the newest transducer just here. So I'm just going to paste the transducer paste that you sent me in here. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just uh, click uh, on uh, 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 it's it's on the left side. Click on load transducer. Load transducer. Oops, load transducer. Transducer loading successful. Okay, so uh, so this looks like the boards, and just let me see if I understand here. The the computer has already sort of fished out from the um, from the saved you know, um, actual attested forms, uh, various uh, words that reconstruct to uh, the same or similar things. So here we have ba. Exactly. And it looks like, yeah, we have three uh, kind of piles of cognates. Yes, and then because that's the because that's the cognates that you have like already uh, corrected once at least. Yes, I see. 
Yeah. So yeah. So they're quite good. And there is uh, I, and here there is just one very tiny thing that needs to be changed. Well, it looks to me like basically, uh, well, for 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 uh, that that these two should be combined, right? Yes, because uh, the Maru was says empty, but uh, there is this m here. Yeah, so it, it, it so etymologically means not exactly. full or not having or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So shall I just dra drag this in uh, here? Try, yeah, you can drag this uh, entirely inside. Okay. Uh, and then the reason there is no reconstruction here is because some reconstruct to ba and some reconstruct to bach. Is that right? Uh, and then do I need to save? Like if I, you know, yeah, if, please. And how do I do that? Uh, just save boards. The 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 third. Uh, save boards. Yeah. So this saves to the cloud. Okay. So let's just do uh, another one just to sort of get the the sense. Okay, so uh, there is another one I noticed. Oh yeah, we have all this blossom, blossom of flowers, blossom of flowers, and then we have here classifier for flowers. Do you think those are the same? Yes, uh, that's a uh, BIM, that's a uh, specificity of BIMish. So, so you, you use the same noun to classify it. So maybe I should, Combine those two. What do you think? Mm, I think so because uh, because basically there are like no uh, words that doesn't really belong. Although um, I'm just noticing, like, do we really think that this pong is related to this? No, I think oh. bong and uh, bong is rangun uh, buing. So in fact, we need to. Uh, we need to create two different etima. So and you can and you can always create a new column by clicking on the on the on the here. button here. Yeah. That's so it. then, for instance, I'll move the the ones with the nasal. Yeah, the pwing and the pong here. Yeah, sounds right. Yeah. But then, yeah, then, oh, and this one too, yeah. yeah, and it's very nice being like Burmese, um, Burmese, Long Chang, Ah Chang, and Xian Dao, which are yeah, which we expect, that we expect to, to be to. closer with each other, and then these ones I yeah, will just just, uh, just do a, a categorical thing, I think. okay. You mean the whole thing like this, yeah. yeah, just make sure we don't have any nasals. No. Okay, so then I can say save boards. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, one activity that then uh, I guess I would go through is just one by one click through these these boards, yeah? Yeah. Um, let's just, uh, you know, uh, zoom along to a further one, maybe this brock or something. Well, that's quite a handful. Yeah, this one is is maybe <laughs> too complicated to go through now. Yeah, but but uh, uh, yeah, a riddle riddle should be the same thing as a uh, false, deceive, and cheat. Uh, let's see, where is a riddle? Oh, there is a riddle. Yeah. Yeah, and the okay. third and the third from the left is like false, false deceive, deceive, and cheat. cheat. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, so I'll move the false deceive cheat one into the riddle, huh? Yeah. Did that work? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it works. Okay, save boards. Now, um, just tell just tell us what this fish means. This fish, this fish means that uh, 
these words are the ones that wasn't considered like uh, reliable enough for um, for like inspection like this la the last time, but this time with better um, uh, with better transducers. Those are fished out, and now we can see if they are really a like reliable cognates like uh, to be changed, and in I general, see. those are. So, so um, basically, like like putting it another way, if something doesn't have a fish, it means it's been there in our system for a while. Exactly. But if it has a fish, it means that since the last time we uploaded a transducer. Mm -hmm. This has gotten, because of the new transducer, has gotten newly fished out of the overall uh, lexical database. So before we begin, uh, we should like uh, paste the current version of our transducers uh, into both the old and new tabs. Now, should I paste the transducer you sent me in the email into the like the new tab, for instance, or? Uh, you, you should paste it into both old and new because old will be like relatively old. Yeah. Like we, uh, like this is like used to, uh, to make further improvements on the transducers. Okay, so I've just, uh, so I'm just going to do that. There it is in old and here it is in new. And now we can check the div because mm, it's the supposed to if should be nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then maybe just to um, I don't know, just to prove the point, I will say right here at the beginning, I'll say blah blah, and then if I say diff, it says blah blah there. Yeah. Now I will delete that because we don't actually want it to say blah blah there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we just need to click on load cognate assignment to 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 fetch the to fetch the cognate assignment that you have just saved. So now I'll load cognate assignment, and now this is load loading from the the assignments we just saved. Is that right? So so here, like you can like compare um, the suggested amount is like in between two or three languages, but of course you can do more. And the actual language under study, like the one that you plan to do something more about, will be put at the end. So yeah, why not Maru, Old Burmese, and Bola? Let's see if we can do something with the Bola. Okay. Let's do so. Yeah, and then it takes a little while. It says compiling correspondence pattern. Okay. Okay. And then now it's done. So we go to report. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so a bunch of not very interesting things that we have already solved. So for example, that uh, old Burmese L corresponds to Bola L. Well, but... Um, Warm so word. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, so Bola L corresponds to Old Burmese uh, L in the word for warm. It doesn't um, surprise us very much. But what are the, what is this raw and default? What does that mean? Uh, raw, uh, so, so default means the, the amount of the things that we are, that are, that are actually, that are currently in the boards. So, so because this uh, fishing mechanism has uh, like a structural flaw, which is that maybe there are things that are super common, but they are never boarded uh, and ah, I see. Boarded, they are not recognized and they will never be recognized. So, so one of the reasons it takes so, uh, such a long time is that, is that actually it's compiled uh, on the raw data also, so that we are not going to like lose anything. So like in this case, uh, F goes to F, or sorry, F corresponds with F. Yeah. There are four examples in the raw data, yeah. but only one has been boarded, to use your term, yeah? 
and uh, the system considers that it's a problem that might uh, there there's some uh, there is some like a heuristic there that say that uh, infers that it there might be a problem. So there is exclamation mark here. Yeah, which is just and 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 the sense that there's a problem is because of the large difference. Yeah, like like if the difference, uh, like if uh, the uh, there are too many in raw that are that aren't accounted like in a proportional way. I see. Yeah, whereas like here it's much more uh, examples, but we have th thirty uh, raw and twenty five in the board. But that's we've gotten most of them, so it kind of doesn't bother us. Yeah. Okay, so here we have, we, there are five in the raw and five that have been boarded, so, so pretty good. Pretty good. And, uh, and so there is a problem here, which is that the, the cross a river word isn't like a properly taken account of in Bola. But that's well, you're, you're jumping a little fast. Let's just say, so we have the, the gloss. This is the shared semantic uh, uh, across all three languages that actually comes from our original you know, data source, which is a comparative word list. And then these are the reconstructions. It has a question mark because not all languages point to it. Exactly. And then Maru, uh, uh, so, and then the first line is the, is the old transducer. And the second line is the new transducer, which are the same because we haven't yet changed the transducer. Exactly. Um, and as you said, uh, there's a problem insofar as if, let me see if I got this is right. Yeah, if the reconstruction is correct, it should have led to this form in BOLA rather than this form. Exactly. So can we try and fix this now? Yeah, let's let's search for let's search for the rhyme and uh, let's search for the vowel. So there it is. Problem of Bola is that it should have it. Uh, the the predicted form has a o, but the actual form has a u. Yeah. And as we see here, this problem is actually very uh, is actually uh, very recurrent. Yeah, it's it's a real problem. Yeah, and I th and a problem that uh, apparently can be solved by just adding a new, uh, new sound law, changing o into u. Yeah, so let's yeah, for try and do that, and then we do that first by finding a uh, bola. So here's we're a transducer for the current proto burmish to bola. Da, 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 sound laws. Let's find some of the vowel sound laws. Um, okay, so let's just so you know, we just need to have this like uh, like after like after all to all so that there is like no feeding or bleeding and it should be okay. Yeah. So shall I put it after all to all? Yeah, because otherwise, because otherwise, every every all will become all. Oh no, no, yeah, I, I understand, but maybe I was tempted to put it sort of right near the end. Uh, I have an idea, but yeah. Uh, we'll give it a try and see whether it messes anything up. Huh? Yeah. That's the idea. Or just for fun, we can uh, we can have it on the uh, on the wrong sequence first. Oh yeah, okay. So I'm gonna just call it. U goes to U. Yeah. And then. U goes to U. And we can remove the conditioning because I think the condition it's probably unconditioned. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, I think this vowel only occurs in open syllables anyhow. Oops. Okay. So I've just defined the sound change, yeah. and then I go down here and put it into uh, and I put it into the right place, which is here. Oops. Maybe type two. Okay. 
And it will be a very good idea to check diff, uh, to look at diff so that we see that nothing, nothing super, nothing superfluous are added. Okay, everything so looks, looks cool. about right. Yeah. Of course, now I, um, yeah, and we can I've lost it, but let's go back to Bola. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then at, like you suggested, what I'm going to do first is actually put it in the wrong place in terms of the sequence of changes. And then we will see how that is reported to us. Does that sound good? Sounds good. So how do I, do I go back to action then and say? Click on get correspondence. Get correspondence. Okay. Okay, and then we go to the report. And look at cross again. And we'll just look for cross. Okay. Well, the, so all of these are, are, are still wrong, which uh, means we haven't fixed the problem, but we do see that uh, it's wrong differently. It's wrong differently. Yeah. Whereas, whereas in the old transducer, it was expecting uh, O, and then now it's expecting O. And then if we just scroll around, yeah, we see that uh, there should be other. No, nothing. I don't think anything will go wrong. You don't point. think anything else will go wrong because it just um, yeah. isn't a, a change that affects very many words. Okay, but now let's uh, let's put it in the right order. Okay, so now we put it in the right order. and go back to get correspondence. And report. And then cross. And now it has fixed the problem and this smiley face has come up, which, which means kind of congratulations, you've fixed the problem. I just scroll down to the other place that comes in the rhyme examples. Uh, oh, did that? It fixed um, some of them, but not all it of them. It fixed some of them, but not all of them. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. The problem is quite thorny. I don't think it can be, uh, it's it can be like just done like this and the egg thing uh, and for the x and for the egg word uh, the thing is that uh, we uh, the initial glottal stop shouldn't like be introducing uh, tenseness neither on maru nor on bola but in fact it introduces it on both so yeah that's like a that's a deeper problem that needs like to be looked into in a deeper way well, but I mean, this shows kind of how well things work, actually, which is we we found a problem, we fixed the problem. It's led to uh, a, a, a the discovery of an of a new sound change in the history of Bola. Also, we have had to put it in the right chronological order so that we're we're developing an increasingly sophisticated model of Bola historical phonology. Uh, both in terms of what sound changes happened and in terms of what order they happened in. And then when we implement the, the, the change, we see that it's, uh, it, it has fixed some of the cases we wanted to fix, but it hasn't fixed all of them. And the reason why it hasn't fixed all of them is that there are yet more subtle problems. And even if we, if we look at them very specifically, you know, uh, how can I say it? we have fixed the vowel, right? Like, like 
in the old transducer here, it predicted the wrong vowel. Now it predicts the right vowel. The problem has something to do with the initial, which we weren't thinking about. And similarly here, uh, the, 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 I mean, I think that egg correctly reconstructs to have a glottal stop initial, and somehow, uh, you know, it, we have a, an issue of the interaction between the glottal stop initial and the creaky uh, voicing that hasn't been modeled, and it sounds like you think maybe shouldn't be modeled in Bola and, and, and Maru, but uh, we can look at that at another occasion. The point is, the vowel correspondence, which is what we were targeting with this intervention, has been fixed. So even though we didn't get smiley faces here because the reconstruction still doesn't predict the attested form, we have still gotten closer, right? That's and it actually like uh, isolates one part of the problem and highlights the remaining problems. Together. Yeah, exactly. And that's the point of, you know, progress in science, right? It's like um, uh, by uh, like, yeah, we've, we've articulated a hypothesis and then we've gotten uh, feedback that that hypothesis is indeed correct. And uh, by articulating the hypothesis, we can uh, um, move on to yet more thorny and subtle problems. So, um, and then I just think it's worth saying that had we, had we um, made a proposal that had uh, broken all sorts of things, there would have been uh, some frowny faces. Um, but I'm a little bit, you know, reluctant to go breaking things intentionally in order to, um, uh, although, although actually let's just, here, here's what we can do. We can say, okay, that's the new one. Exactly. Go in, paste it into old. Yeah. And then you need to paste the original thing into the new. Well, I'll just uh, say, go to Bola, and then I'll just delete the, um, yeah, the new sound flow. The new sound change, which is this one. Yeah. Actually, I'll just, I'll just comment it out. I think that's a nice way of doing it. Okay, and then we go to action. So, you know, just to be clear to all you uh, kids at home, uh, what we're doing here is intentionally breaking it in order to show you the way that the report uh, happens when, when you break something. So we go to the report and then go to cross. And here we have this frowny face because the previous you know, now the old transducer correctly uh, predicted the attested form, but the new transducer does not. And that's why we've gotten that frowny face. So, um, I mean, this basically, this is very similar to the board view, right? Uh, but uh, what we have is it printed like you would have in a, in, in, in a finished uh, dictionary. Uh, and actually, let's just look at the, at the very beginning because we saw that with the boards. We have this word uh, exist and this other word exist, which are not combined because this printout came from, you know, before I just did that. But they're still presented next to each other. And uh, what, what I think is particularly nice about this uh, system, and I will even you know, zoom in some more, is if we look at this exist, uh, we have the, the, the different meanings that occur. And then this check mark means that this attested form is predicted by our current transducers, whereas this X mark means that this attested form is not uh, predicted by our transducers. And when we get the X, it also tells us here what reconstruction would have uh, predicted that attested form. And so, so this is a huge amount of information about what's regular, what's irregular, 
what areas uh, can be looked at for improvement. That's all you know, more or less done automatically, right? So I think that's a very powerful um, component of this system that shows its potential both for, for making etymological dictionaries faster, uh, but also for making them more rigorous and explicit. So we have just seen the KPI interfaces for the cognitive reassignment and also for the debugging of the transducers of the phonological history. Uh, some things work and some don't, but in general, I think it's fairly easy to see that we have uh, something that is um, that really assists the linguists in the creation and elaboration of historical linguistic hypotheses. So uh, I hope that our approach could lead to a more human-centered approach in computer-assisted historical linguistics where, you know, where linguists by being forced by the computer to be a little bit more rigorous, a bit more explicit, can reap actual benefits in, in having the dirty details taken care of by the computer and uh, seeing, where, seeing exactly the things that need to change and the things that don't. And uh, uh, in our case, we developed this methodology for the, uh, um, for the Burmish languages, which are languages uh, with a relatively reduced syllable canon and with a uh, very little morphology except a uh, syllable composition with uh, almost no morphophonology and uh, there's also no paradigms everything is agglutinative so there's no analogical effects uh, there are not that much analogical effects either so uh, if we are going to uh, port this approach uh, outside of, let's say, China, China and uh, mainland Southeast Asia, we'll need to um, make better transducer engines, which can be which can be uh, tailored to deal with the alignment problem, which is quite thorny in non in non monosyllabic languages and also we'll need to find the ways of encoding and working with paradigmatic morphology and um, analogical historical changes so i hope that uh, this is a good start and uh, with a further improvement on the road it could lead to a future world uh, to a future world of verified reconstructions where historical linguists can uh, really show that what they propose uh, at least uh, do uh, have an internal consistency the reconstructed forms with the reconstructed changes uh, do lead to the attested forms thank you very much